And this is Pastor M.D. Lewis, the speaker for the Bible Interpreter Tapes. We are continuing our study of uh, the subject of wrath in the Bible as related to God's character. The title of this study is God's Wrath in the Commandments. I turn your attention to Romans 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, that's a very interesting observation, and we ought to look at it very carefully. Uh, Paul says, I speak to you who know the law. That is, he's speaking uh, either to the Christians who are fundamentally uh, educated in the Bible teaching concerning the law of God, or he's speaking uh, in reference to his own Jewish people who are very familiar uh, with the law in the sense of the Old Testament. Uh, I speak to you who know the law, that the law hath dominion. That is, it rules over, controls the individual's life as long as he lives. Now, you notice in this text, it, it does not uh, categorize whether or not a person is a saint or whether a person is uh, one who disbelieves in God or, as we may say, is a Gentile or reprobate. It doesn't make any difference. The law still has dominion as long as he draws a breath. Whether he's living in goodness in the life of Christ or whether he's living in his own life of sin and wrath, it doesn't make any difference. And that's what we ought to conclude up to this point from the previous studies, <clears throat> that uh, sin and wrath are synonymous terms in the Bible. And the second study, that the function of the law of the Ten Commandments is repetitive in the life of the individual, whether or not he's saint or a reprobate, and that his life is reflecting back upon himself, so that if he lives a life of sin, as long as that law has dominion over him, the law is going to govern his life in the way of hatred, wrath, and destruction, or it will govern his life in the sense of righteousness, justification, and the love of God for eternal life. Now, this point we must see, or the, uh, the one's understanding of the wrath of God in the Bible will be very difficult and will always have the reflection that is commonly understood, that after certain provocations, uh, God gets angry and deals in, in wrath and fury and hatred and destroys individuals. But, of course, this is not correct. This is attributing to God the characteristics of Satan, which is, of course, blasphemy. So let's take a look again into the subject and <clears throat> remember the text that uh, I read in the book of uh, Hosea, the ninth chapter. How long does the law have dominion over you? And I want to call your attention again uh, as we go into the study deeper, uh, the uh, Hosea 9, 7, and 8. The day of visitations are come, the day of recompense. Now that means the day when the function of the law in the life of the individual, either in the sense of its consummating in hatred and destruction or consummating in salvation in regards to the, the saint trusting in Christ. So the day of visitation is when the consequence of one's life, either sinly, sinful or saintly, when that law and their life catches up with them for the final, uh, the final declaration of their destiny. So here he says here, the days of recompense are come, Israel shall know it. That is, Israel will finally come to either a, a conclusion uh, of destruction uh, as a result of their uh, sin or whatever God would reward them in the sense of their righteousness. He said, the spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and thy great hatred. Now I want to emphasize Again, as we've already studied, the word hatred in Hebrew, satam, is the word in which satan comes from, which, of course, is Satan. It's translated right from Hebrew right into English. Now, the great hatred that uh, will materialize is when the hatred of an individual reaches the point in which the individual will, uh, will exhibit attributes of murder and killing and destruction in the sense of human life. 
Now, that's the great hatred. In the next study, uh, we'll take up uh, <clears throat> this great hatred of Satan as he manifested uh, it against Christ at Calvary. So, the, the great hatred is when the individual, in his animosity towards God, uh, permits that animosity and hatred to move into a situation where the person will either kill the prophets or uh, kill the saints or manifest uh, destruction of life in some sort or another. So keep that in mind. Uh, the great uh, visitation then is when the hatred of the consequence of the sins of the fathers on the children finally come to the place in the children that they will turn uh, in the sense of destruction uh, of taking life. Now, remember the text in Romans 4, uh, verse 15, and um, I want to emphasize this and then enlarge and extend it into the, the New Testament. This is uh, Romans 4, 15, because the law worketh wrath. That is, the law works hatred. And finally, it will work that hatred uh, until it uh, consummates uh, in destruction of the prophets or the destruction of the saints or uh, destruction of human life. Now, I want to take your attention to the book of Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, and notice in the writing of the prophet how this hatred develops in the lives of individuals inspired by Satan and how it will be dealt with in the Scripture. I am reading now from Ezekiel 20, verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. Now, um, this is a very fine text and we uh, will do well to look at it in a very uh, uh, analytical way. Here God says, I will rule over you. And I'm speaking, of course, to uh, the sinful Israel in the Old Testament. I will rule over you by my fury poured out. By fury poured out. Now, he doesn't say my fury poured out, but by fury poured out will I rule over you. So, in other words, through the consequence of their anger and hatred and wrath, those very characteristics will be the characteristics that God uses to rule over the individual. Now, by this time, a person should be, uh, begin to see that wrath in the Bible is a characteristic of sin and not a characteristic of God. Now, how this could be attributed to God, we will take up uh, in the next few lessons. But let us pursue this particular idea, how God rules over the individual uh, through their wrath and indignation. I turn again to the book of Isaiah, the 13th chapter, and uh, I want to call your attention to uh, verses 1 and 2. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Now he's speaking about Babylon and says, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Now here it says that uh, God has chosen uh, his mighty ones. Now this word mighty one uh, in the Hebrew language uh, in many uh, instances is the, uh, the word gibor, which means a mighty warrior. And in some instances it refers to Satan, and some instances that term refers to God himself. But here it says, I have also called my mighty ones, uh, that is, those who are controlled by Satan, uh, he has uh, called his mighty ones for mine anger. Now let me point this out uh, uh, in a more specific manner. In Isaiah 10, verse 5, it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is my indignation. Now, here you see it very, uh, very uh, explicitly says <coughs> excuse me, that the anger of the Assyrians 
expressed in their use of the staff or rod, which is their power and, and control, uh, is the anger of God's indignation. Now you can see why he said in Ezekiel 20, 33, that God rules over them in fury and wrath. That is, he rules over them with the rod of their enemies expressing wrath and anger against Israel. And the, the previous verse, he expressed it of Babylon. Here it is Assyria. And you'll recall that it was Babylon who brought subjection to the, uh, the tribes of Judah, and it was Assyria that brought subjection uh, to Israel or brought Israel under their, under their subjection. So you see the, the God is using the anger that the children of Israel, by their life of sin and wrath, stir up in their neighbors, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and God permits these people to come against them uh, for their destruction. Now, there's a, st a statement in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 238, that says, To this day there are still aspects of truth which are dimly seen, connections that are not understood, and far-reaching depths in the law of God that are uncomprehended. There is an immeasurable breadth, dignity, and glory in the law of God, and yet the religious world has set this law aside as did the Jews, to exalt traditions and the commandments of men. Now, this text is certainly applicable to these studies. Uh, there are great depths of the law, and we need to see them. They, she says they are dimly understood, and I hope that these uh, studies on the wrath of God will certainly enlarge your comprehension of the depths of the law of God uh, as it uh, has to do and deal with uh, the how God rules through the wrath and anger and indignation of the enemies of Israel to bring control and rule over Israel. Now, you remember that's the text I read in, in Ezekiel 20, 33, I will rule over you in fury. Now, some people may take that to mean God's fury of his character. This is far from the truth. Uh, it is the wrath and anger and fury of the neighbors around uh, uh, Israel that they have stirred up by their their hatred and animosity and their uh, the, their tongues of, uh, of hatred and violation of God's law as it is projected uh, in their dealings with their neighbors. Now, notice this statement from Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1094. Now, this is a very, very significant uh, aspect in the interpretation of wrath. What is temptation? It is the means by which those who claim to be the children of God are tested and tried. We read that God tempted Abraham, that he tempted the children of Israel. Now, you may recall that in James, the first chapter, verse 13, it says, God tempts no man. Now, here it says, God tempted Abraham. Now, here comes the sentence of interpretation. She says, this means that he permitted circumstances to occur to test their faith and lead them to look to him for help. So God's tempting the individual is not actually God tempting them, but God's permitting them under circumstances uh, to occur to bring them to understand their position and their faith. So this uh, observation where it says God tempted Abraham, and of course the Bible says God tempts no man, uh, would indicate somewhat of a contradiction, but it's really no contradiction because uh, when one understands how God uses uh, nations and people and circumstances, uh, then they will understand uh, the meaning of this. As it says, as I said in James 1.13, God tempts no man. So it seems like a contradiction on the surface, but when it understands the function of law, you'll understand that it is no contradiction, as Sister White already observed in this text uh, statement from the Bible commentary. The individual uh, brings the conditions of law of sin upon himself and the fact that God permits these circumstances to occur is stated as though God did it because it is the function of the law that God ordained by which wrath and hatred uh, exist. And because God is the one uh, who has created the law and his function, it says that God did it when God only permitted his law to function in the sense of hatred and sin and wrath for their destruction. Now, in the scripture, as you know, from time to time, 
Uh, the Bible speaks uh, many times of using objects of nature like trees. Uh, <clears throat> as a good tree brings forth good fruit, and an evil tree brings forth evil fruit. Now, in the analysis of this tree, we will have exactly what we want to bring in this lesson. As the characteristics of the fruit are developed from the seed through the roots and branches, it is evident that the final production of the fruit is the result of the growing process. Now, the quality of the fruit could not be attributed to another tree nearby. The biological laws of the tree's growth, its producing fruit, are certainly of God's creation. If credit is to be cited for the quality of the fruit, it is obviously it would be divided between the laws God ordained in the growing process and in the particular kind of the fruit and the qualities of its nature. Now, inasmuch as God is the author of the laws of the biological processes in which the, the nurture, nourishment of the soil and the moisture in the soil and the, the sunlight uh, and the photosynthesis gathered in the leaves, by all this biological process the fruit is produced, you may say that God did it because the laws by which the fruit was produced of uh, biology were God's laws. But when you look at the quality of the fruit, whether it is an apple or an orange, or a good quality of an apple or an orange, or even some bad kind of fruit that might be even poisonous, although the laws of God would still operate in those trees even to produce a poisonous fruit, the, uh, you could say that God produced the fruit by the process of his laws. But in reality, the quality of the fruit, the, the species of fruit, and the functions of the nourishment and so forth brings the quality into the fruit, and this could be either good or bad. So you see, even in the aspects of nature, if we look at the process and function, we would attribute the process of law to God. Now, the same with wrath, as I've already shown you in, in the previous lessons and this lesson, that the law works wrath. Now, when you think of the law working la wrath, like the law uh, produces the fruit uh, in the growth of the tree, you can attribute it to God because it's God's laws that are functioning. Now, here is a very, very necessary distinction to interpret the wrath of God uh, in the Scripture. When you look at the process of law and the process of law of wrath and sin and anger and hate, you may attribute that to God in the sense of the process of function of law. By no means is it describing the character of God's conduct. And on the other hand, we would say that the fruit is bad, it's uh, poisonous, or it is uh, not a good quality because of the nature of the tree. And so this is the way uh, in the, the Scripture uh, that uh, we need to look at uh, uh, this, these events. Now, let me cite you a case in the Bible that brings this point clearly to focus. I'm reading now in Second Chronicles, the 12th chapter of this book. Now, I want to specifically point out as we go along the, how this particular event in the Bible history uh, is uh, applicable to what we're saying in this lesson. This is Second Chronicles 12, verse 1 and, and following. It came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord, and all Israel with him. Now, from that statement, you can see, they uh, have chosen to live in sin and disregard the love uh, and the character of Christ in the law. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Now, right here, I want to quote that tremendous statement that I referred to in a previous lesson. Uh, when parents or rulers do not punish iniquity, God will take the case in hand. His protecting care will be in a measure removed from the agencies of evil so that a chain of circumstances will arise to punish sin with sin. Now watch it how it comes out in this story. So they turned away from the law of God. They turned away from God's perfection, uh, protection. And as a consequence, God permitted the Egyptians to come up against Jerusalem. Verse 3, with 1,200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt. Uh, verse 4, and he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. 
Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore I have left you in the hand of Shishak. Now when they turned away from the law, that is to obey it in the sense of its love and goodness and eternal life, when they turned away from that, then God is going to rule over them by fury of uh, Shishak, which is exactly uh, the text that I, I read you. So here it says, he left them in the hands of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. Now, you see, that's very clear. It says here, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Now, he says, my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Now, you see, this is just like the tree uh, the, the functional process of what agitated Shishak to come up against Judah uh, is a process of law, of wrath, of sin, and death. Now, God will rule over them by their choices to turn away from God and to pursue a course of wrath. He will use that wrath to govern them through the hand of Shishak. Now, when they humbled themselves, then the prophet came and said, Now, I will deliver you from Shishak, and my wrath, which is functioning through the agitation that the Jews brought uh, uh, in their dealing with Shishak upon themselves, uh, his wrath would not uh, be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Now, you see, this statement, what it says here, what God permitted Shishak to do is attributed to God as if he did it. For it says, I will destroy them. My wrath shall be poured out. But my wrath is uh, in the sense that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives, even if he lives in wrath and sin, as was at this case Rehoboam and all Israel with him. So he permitted their wrath to stir up the wrath of Shishak, and God used Shishak as an exhibition of his wrath on Israel because the whole process is by the law of God. Now you can see why this statement in Patriarchs and Prophets 306, I think in a previous statement I said 406, notice now how the Sister White interprets this explicitly in the line of these studies that I am bringing to you. Now this is from page 306, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and it is in relationship of her comment on the statement of the visitation of the iniquities of the fathers on the children. Uh, page 306, and it says, And to those who are faithful in his service, Mercy is promised not merely to the third and fourth generations, as is the wrath threatened against those who hate him, but unto thousands of generations. Now, you see, she's quoting this uh, statement from uh, Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6, and she said, Now, God's mercy and goodness would be extended to thousands of generations. And in contrast, that she says that, uh, that the... Uh, promise that the, the wrath shall be visited to the third and fourth generations, as is the wrath threatened against those who hate him. Now, here she interprets to put the word wrath in those who hate him. Now, the text says the iniquities of the fathers. Now, you see, here she's taken out the term iniquity of fathers and put in wrath threatened against those who hate, where the text said the iniquities on the, uh, of the fathers on the children who hate. Now, you see, her interpretation is precisely correct. The iniquity of the fathers on the children is the wrath of God because of its function. Now, a person must see this or he will not be able to interpret this subject of the wrath of God as it really is indicative in the individual. Now, let me cite you a tremendous text in the Scripture, one that's very difficult to deal with, Unless a person sees it in the light of these studies, uh, you probably will find a difficulty with this text. I'm reading Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light. Now, this is God speaking. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace. I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
Now, how would you deal with this text that says, I form the darkness, which is a symbol of sin, and I create evil? And that word create in that text is the same word for create in Genesis 1.1. I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, you know that there are many places in the Bible where it says God cannot even look on evil. And here it says he creates it. Now, a person must understand in this text that God permits Satan to create it. And inasmuch as Satan creates it by the process of God's law of sin and wrath and death, it is stated that God does it. So it's just like saying here that a tree that brings forth poison fruit uh, is God's operation because all the biological processes in the growth of the tree are God's laws. And that's the same in this particular text here. So you see, in these verses, a person must comprehend that God's wrath in the commandments is not God's wrath in his character being exhibited, but the persons who choose to live in sin and wrath and hatred, and that law will have dominion over them as long as they live. So God's wrath in the law is only the function of the lives of sinners, as was in the case of Rehoboam, when they turned away from God's law, he permitted Shishak to exhibit <clears throat> wrath, and it was spoken of as God's wrath. <coughs> now, uh, notice in the book of <clears throat> Psalms, the 55th chapter, verses uh, 3. Psalms 55, verse 3. Here the prophet writes, Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the expression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. In wrath they hate God. Now the process of, of the hatred in the case of the Israel, came from their fathers hating God, and as a result of their children uh, incurring the consequence of their father's deeds, it says here, the, in wrath they hate me, and the process of that wrath is the function of God's law. And in that sense, it says, we may say, that God's wrath is in the commandments of the law of sin and death, of the iniquities of the fathers, expressed in the conduct of the children, of which Sister White says is the wrath of God operating by his law. law. And as long as those people have, the, uh, have a hatred toward God, that law will have dominion, and God will rule in their lives through the wrath and hatred in their own conduct.